All right, welcome to CS 2050. Second half, the topic is strong induction. So in strong induction, again, every time we give you a proof technique, we're giving you a tool to put in your toolbox, your repertoire. So then you give, you're given a problem, you work on it with your tools, you pull out your wrenches and hammers. Strong induction is like, if induction was a hammer, strong induction is a bigger hammer. And it's a more powerful hammer. But you know, sometimes if you have like something small to do, and you pull out the big hammer, it's embarrassing. So you want to use strong induction only when you really need it. Um, basic induction, induction is, let's rewrite induction. Induction, is, again, says that if something is true for some base case, and that something is, uh, and that um, if for all k, that 5k implies 5k plus 1, our induction step, so the induction step plus a base <coughs> case, this all together implies for all n uh, that phi of n, right? Let's try that. But uh, strong induction uh, is also true, but it gives you a bigger hammer. Uh, Again, you assume some base cases, excuse me, you prove some base case, and for all k, you don't assume an induction hypothesis to be one thing, but in fact, this is the strong induction. You get a much stronger induction hypothesis that uh, phi of 1 and dot, 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 and 5k implies 5k plus 1. I guess this could be zero. Doesn't really matter. This whole thing implies for all n, phi of n. Right? So strong induction is simply, oh, camera's not on. Strong induction is simply, uh, the only difference between strong induction and induction is the fact that strong induction allows you not to assume and in one induction hypothesis, but in fact, k many induction hypothesis, right? You don't necessarily assume it's true for one k that to show k plus one, but you show it's true for all k from zero to k, and then that may imply k plus one. Well, normal induction may help you in the sense that you have one domino knocks over another, one domino knocks over another, and so on, right? Strong induction. The best way to think about it is that a domino being knocked over may require the help of several dominoes from way back, right? Several things may affect those in the future. It's not true that 2 implies 3, implies 4, implies 5, but that 2, 3, and 4 imply 5. 3, 4, and 5 imply 6. You may need all of those together to imply the next domino to fall over. Now, it certainly is as exactly as true as induction is. You should believe strong induction to be valid if you believe induction to be valid, certainly. But where it helps is sometimes you need to imply an induction hypothesis deeper than just the previous recurrence, sort of uh, when it gets used. Any questions on the statement of strong induction? So consider the following sequence. Uh, a0, A1, a2 dot, 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 for all n that is a natural. Consider that a0 is equal to 0, a1 is equal to 1, and a uh, n is equal to 2 times a n minus 1 plus, uh, or excuse me, is it minus? Let me double check. Minus a n minus 2 plus 2 uh, for n greater than or equal to 2. Okay? This is called a recurrence. A recurrence is an infinite sequence defined with some base cases and a recursive equation. A recursive equation as in it's some, the next digit, the next element of the sequence is some formula of previous elements in the sequence. Perhaps this one is just a linear combination of the two previous ones. Sometimes it's like a of n is equal to 2 times a of n over 2 or something, square root of a of n, whatever, right? Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do to define a recursive sequence. Now, this is going, we're going to prove that this recursive sequence has what's called the closed form. So this is called the recurrence. 
and then over here is called a closed form. A closed form uh, is just some like nice, simple, easy to read formula such that it doesn't require applying the recurrence a thousand times to compute a of a thousand, right? Um, if you had to conjecture what is a closed formula for this recurrence, what would you say? What do you think a of three is? Excuse me, what is a of two? One. A of two would be two times one minus zero plus two is four. A of three would be four. We get zero, one, four. What is a of three? What is two times four? Minus, minus one plus two? What is that pattern? Square numbers. Yeah. A of n is equal to n squared. Or n greater than or equal to zero. Surprising, isn't it? That's not, look, that doesn't look anything like a square. Uh, but yet I claim that A of n is equal to n squared. You can prove it to yourself by induction. The great part about closed form is, say I asked you for, I asked you for 1,000. What you could do is write down a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 6, all the way to a 1,000. But if you have a closed form expression of it, you can just plug in 1,000 and you're done, right? So you can compute the 1,000th one without having to compute all those previous, right? It doesn't have a recurrence in it. This is not recursive by definition. It's just the nice way to do it, right? It's a that's why it's called a closed form. Like, we don't have to do it. It's a lot easier, not a lot of work. Um, let's prove it. And of course, such a proof should proceed by, by induction. Uh, oh, I have space here. Let's, let's, we proceed by strong induction. Proceed by strong induction. Now, I'll say the base cases on strong induction a little more fine-grained. You need to spend more attention on it. Uh, base cases... A0 is equal to 0, which is equal to 0 squared. A1 is equal to 1, which is equal to 1 squared. So we've done our base cases, right? Now, uh, suppose uh, for 0 less than equal, for some i less than equal uh, from 0 to k, that uh, A of i is equal to i squared. For i is 0 through k. Right? Now, I just want to make a comment on the base cases. This is really from A1, uh, A2 to K. Because 2 is defined recursively from 1 and 0. Right? But 1 is not defined recursively from 0 and negative 1. Right? The first recursive definition one starts at 2. Right? So you have to make sure when you do your induction assumption, your, uh, your induction hypothesis, that it, do, it is actually covered by all possible base cases. Let's suppose it, instead of the sum of the two previous, it was the sum of like the seven previous. Then you would start the recurrence at the seventh one, right? And you would have to show six base cases. That's what you would have to prove. It's a little, you have to be careful that you don't want to assume something and you skip over a number and something is false because you're trying to tr prove it true for all n. I could see many people making a mistake here and proving something for all n except 3 or something like this, right? Someone forgetting something with the base case. Though that's what the base cases cover, right? Um, now we prove, yeah, yes? We start at 2 then in that inequality instead of 0 to i to. It could be done. It, would, it, it could be done. But I'm, this specific one is n greater than or equal to 0, that this is the closed form. Sometimes a closed form has odd base cases, like special weird things. Like, suppose I chose this same recurrence, but I started with 3 and 10. It would be something else, right? Different sequence, but it would be a weird sequence. So sometimes you'll get a recurrence and say, prove it's equal to i cubed minus, excuse me, n cubed minus n for n greater than or equal to 5. You know, sometimes it's defined that way. Here, only because the closed form is true for all n greater than or equal to 0. Not for all n greater than or equal to 3 or 2 or whatever. Am I going to start with that? Yeah. It's something that will come with practice. Really. All right? Uh, we prove that, I, that a of i plus, excuse me, a of k plus 1 is equal to k plus 1 squared. Okay? 
we, we may assume that the first k of them are squares. We'll show that k plus 1 term in the sequence is going to be a square as well. Is the k plus 1 square, in fact. Consider that a of, a of k plus 1 is equal to 2 times a of k minus a of k minus 1 plus 2. By the induction hypothesis, by the strong induction, we know that a of k is equal to k squared, and a of k minus 1 is equal to what? By the induction hypothesis, what is a of k minus 1 equal to? Why is that true? Because you assume for i between 0 and k. k minus 1 is strictly less than k, right? So a of k is k squared by the, by the induction hypothesis. a of k minus 1 is k minus 1 squared, again by the induction hypothesis. So a of k plus 1 is equal to 2 times k squared plus, excuse me, minus k minus 1 squared plus 2, which is equal to 2k squared uh, minus uh, k squared minus 2k plus 1 plus 2, which is equal to 2k squared minus k squared plus 2k minus 1 plus 2, which is equal to k squared plus 2k plus 1, which is equal to k plus 1 squared, as desired. So we see uh, for all n greater than or equal to 0 that uh, uh, a of n is equal to n squared, by strong induction, in fact. Notice how we applied the strong induction. If we had normal induction, we would get that, OK, fine, a of k is k squared. But what is a of k minus 1? We don't get that by induction. We only get that by strong induction. And we, here is a classic example where you would need strong induction. You absolutely need strong induction. Yes? Uh, with a closed form, where you have a sub n, uh, could you, uh, uh, like, to keep the bounds on the current one, could you do, like, a sub n minus 2, and then n is greater than or equal to 2? That would be true. Or not, not, um, not n minus, just n squared on the right side. Um, it's impolite, I would say. I would say it's bad notation. Right? You want to keep the, you want to define not a of k plus 1 or a of 2 to the n or something like this. You want to define a of n as a function of n. Right? Uh, a of n should be written as some f of n, for n is like squared, square root, plus, minus, whatever, right? Something like that. You want to write the, a, the nth term of the sequence in terms of n, not the nth plus one term of the sequence in terms of n, right? Otherwise, you can just subtract from both sides and do your, do your little magic, right? It would, it would still work out. Yeah. But only here, by the way, this is a, a, a thing specific to this problem, which is not true in general, where the base cases also plug into the recurrence. Excuse me, the base cases also satisfy the closed form. This is, a, note that this is an oddity and does not happen often in, pro, in problems you'll do. You'll prove the closed form is only true for n greater than or equal to 3 or something. And then the base cases are just hard-coded weird numbers. Right? Questions on this? All right. Notice, importantly, strong induction, how it plays a role. All right, let's do another problem. Um, consider that you have a rectangle of n pieces, right? You have n pieces. It's like a chocolate bar or something, right? It's, they're all squares. What is the fewest number of cuts you can make to break this up into one by one pieces?
And consider we're not concerning ourselves with the height and width of it as kind of a spoiler, but just suppose you had a 1 by n bar, chocolate bar. It's a 1 by n. How many cuts do you need to break up the, the piece into 1 by 1 pieces? n minus 1. There's n minus 1 lines to draw, right? If you have a 2, consider how many cuts you need to break up a, a 2 piece that only takes one cut, right? So this takes n minus 1 cuts. What if I gave you, let's try another, let's try another. Consider a practice, consider a 3 by 2, OK? Think of a strategy that minimizes the number of cuts that this needs to take, right? You break it up into two pieces, and then each of those can be broken up into two pieces, and so on, right? Each cut takes one piece and breaks it up into two pieces according to one of the straight lines. So let's say you do this cut first, right? You'll have a 2 by 1 and then a 4 by 4. Then you can cut that there. So like if I give you a piece like this, you can cut it like that, and then you can cut the top piece like that, and then, then that piece like that, and then this bottom piece like this, and then that piece like that. And then you can cut this one like this, and then like that, and then that one like that, something like that, right? So you take a piece, you cut it. You cut it, you cut it, you cut it. One piece at a time. How many cuts do you need to take uh, it into n minus 1 pieces? And, and excuse me, into, I, into n pieces, each one by one. It turns out there is no smart strategy to do this. You might think, well, I'm going to cut them you know, big pieces first and then big pieces or something, some sort of divide and conquer algorithm strategy, something interesting. You know, It turns out this problem is actually not interesting. Uh, it always takes, always takes n minus 1 cuts to decompose it into uh, n pieces, OK? Now, n here is not the, it's the area. It's, it's the number of total pieces in the area, not a length or width, OK? Um, we proceed by strong induction. Um, base case, n equals 1. So you have a single chocolate piece. How many cuts does it take to break it up into one by one piece? Sorry, what? Zero cuts. We're already there. So uh, base case of n is equal to one piece is done. Takes zero cuts. Great. Uh, suppose all uh, k sized pieces, all uh, I sized pieces for one less than equal to I less than equal to K take I minus one cuts. We show a, a rectangle of area uh, K plus one takes exactly uh, k cuts, OK? Now, I'm going to do something a little different, OK? Normally, we, we've done k implies k plus 1, right? But just for the cleanliness and the proof, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to show that k plus 1, excuse me, k minus 1 implies k. You're allowed to do that in the proof. That is something that you have to delegate if you want to do that based off of cleanliness. So instead of showing i is greater than or equal to, from 1 to k, it's 1 to k minus 1. Uh, and this takes uh, i minus 2 cuts. Uh, no, excuse me, it still takes i minus 1 cuts. We will show a rectangle of area k takes exactly k minus 1 cuts, right? Consider, convince yourself that those are the same thing. Sometimes we want to write the proof this way just because it's cleaner. OK? Consider a rectangle of area k. Cut it anywhere. It is now in two pieces, each 
of size, uh, two pieces of sizes. One piece is going to be some size. Let's, let's call it size i. Okay. The, p the other piece, if you remove i squares from a piece of k squares, how many pieces are left over? k minus i. Okay. By strong induction, And of course, i is greater than or equal to 1 here, right? You make a cut, it splits it into two pieces of area, some area. By strong induction, the piece of size i takes uh, i minus 1 cuts. The piece of size k minus i takes k minus i minus 1 cuts. So the piece of size k takes k uh, takes you the number of cuts it takes is equal to the first cut to break it into those two pieces, plus the number of cuts to break each of those pieces up all the way down to one piece. So it's going to be i minus one plus i minus k minus one, right? You'd make one cut initially to break it up into two pieces. Then you make one cut initially. Then you break this one up by the induction hypothesis using i minus 1 cuts. And you break this one up with the induction hypothesis using i minus k minus i minus 1 cuts. So the total number of cuts required is i minus 1 plus k minus i minus 1 plus 1. Well, let's just work that out. We're going to get k minus i plus i minus 2 plus 1, which is equal to, those are going to cancel, which is just equal to k minus 1, as desired. QD. Right. Notice sort of how general we had to be. I didn't specify where the cut was made, but we know that the cut partitions the the area into two pieces. That's all that's needed, right? And uh, notice also that this, in, this proof doesn't really address the strategy question. It doesn't mention, it's, it's sort of, again, superior to that. It doesn't say, like, there is no good strategy for this. But because no matter how, because of the, ch the, the proof is independent of the choices of the cut made, you can conclude from this that there is no smart algorithm or something that does this better. If you're breaking up a bar of chocolate at the table, you have to do n minus 1 cuts. You can't avoid it, right? There's no way around that. It, that's exactly what it takes. There's no smart snipe or you know, some trick or something. You know? This is all the best thing you can do. Again, notice how this was requiring strong induction and not induction, right? If I had to use induction here, I would have to ensure that one piece was k minus 1 and one piece was of size 1. But that doesn't prove that there's no strategy. That proves that if you follow this specific strategy of breaking off one piece at a time, then of course it takes k minus 1 cuts, right? So uh, for all n greater than or equal to 1, it takes n minus 1 cuts. Well, we've concluded, right? Questions on that one? Right, again, it's one of the, another thing to stress is sometimes a problem is not defined recursively. Uh, you may have some experience programming recursive algorithms, right, in some coding class, a function to call itself. Uh, induction and recursion historically even used to mean the same thing. They, they were the same word. But sometimes a problem is not defined recursively, and it's your job to shine a little spotlight and find the recursion in it, right? This is not obvious where the recursion is. It's just you break it up into pieces. But every time you break it up into pieces, you now have smaller pieces which are broken up into more pieces. So that's sort of where your recursion comes from. But as the problem's worded, that's not obvious. It's your job to find that recursion, apply the induction hypothesis to the recursion, and then conclude the proof. That's something that you'll have to gain from experience. Right? More questions on the technique, on the writing? You certainly believe it to be true, right? Uh, yes. Uh, 
uh, can we start with uh, uh, 1 to k and then prove the case of k, k plus 1? Correct. Yeah, you can do that as well. You can either show k implies k plus 1. For cleanliness, sometimes you can show k minus 1 implies k. Either one is OK. And whichever one, if you only did one way, that's, a, that's OK. Sometimes for proof cleanliness, you can choose one or the other. Sometimes it's like the math works out just slightly less annoyingly. Suppose you had like k plus 1 cubed, and you had to like foil and factor a bunch of stuff, versus like k cubed, something like that. Sometimes it's easier when you work out the math. Either one of those is fine, right? Because consider the limit is the same, right? Questions? All right, let's do one more example. And then I'll allude to the example we'll do Thursday. We proved, does anyone remember the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? It's fundamental, so I hope so. Is it the any number can be represented by a multiplication, by a unique um, multiplication of prime numbers? Yes. Every number uh, n greater than or equal to 2 has a unique prime factorization. So we actually didn't prove this last time. We proved uh, the uniqueness part. We said suppose a number has two distinct prime factorizations, and we show that this factorization has to be the same. So basically what we proved is if a number has a prime factorization, then it's unique. But we didn't actually prove that a number has a prime factorization. It turns out we can do this kind of trivially by induction. Every number greater than or equal to 2 is prime or a product of primes. We won't prove the uniqueness because we did that last time, like weeks ago. We're just going to prove uh, that there is a prime factorization. Recall when you do such a proof, you're supposed to prove such a, th such a thing exists and that it's unique. We only proved the uniqueness last time, I think. Today we're going to prove that it exists. In some sense, this is the proof that shows that like, the, the prime numbers are themselves the atoms. Right? They are, everything can be decomposed into it. Right? Um, uh, base case, we proceed. Uh, by strong induction. Base case is what? All right. Why uh, is the base case true? Two is prime. Yeah. So two is prime. So it is. Every number is. We're trying to prove that every number is prime or a product of primes, and two is prime. So we're done. Suppose. Every i from uh, i from two to k can be written it is either prime or a product of primes. Right. Consider uh, k plus one. It is prime or composite? Prime or not prime? Case one, k plus one is prime. We are done. Because we're trying to prove that every number is prime or a product of prime. So if k plus one is prime, we're done. Case two, the more the serious case, k plus one is composite. So there exists a comma b, a less than, uh, strictly less than k plus 1, b strictly less than k plus 1, such that um, k plus 1 is equal to a times b. Right? If a number is not prime, it's composite. So if it's a composite, it's a product of two smaller numbers. By strong induction, A and B uh, are written uh, 
as products of primes. So suppose A is equal to P1, that, 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 P, I don't know, R. B is equal to Q1, that, 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 Q, I don't know, S. Or P1 uh, to PR, Q1 to QS, R prime. Then, k plus 1 is equal to a times b, which is equal to p1 to pr, q1 to qs, which is a product of primes. Which is what we want. We just wrote k plus 1 as a product of primes, right? Therefore, for all n greater than or equal to 2, n is a prime or a product of primes. QED. Questions on that one? Notice again how the strong induction worked. If a number is composite, it's written as the product of two numbers. But by the induction hypothesis, those two numbers are themselves products of primes. So then, of course, k plus 1 must be a product of two numbers, which are products of primes. So then, the, therefore, k plus 1 is a product of primes. right? Or maybe, a, maybe it's even the case that a and b are themselves prime or products of primes. right? But it's just an, a single prime, which is then a product of primes. Right? Questions on this one? Again, notice how the strong induction worked. We weren't able to say anything even about the size of a or b. Like, we don't know that, like, A is K minus 3 or something like that. We have no idea. But we just know that it's stronger. Like, if K was, like, 32, it's written as the product of two smaller numbers, let's say 2 and 16. We don't know. We, that's for any way to split it up, right? It could be even the case that uh, K plus 1 can be written as the product of three numbers, but then just choose B to be the product of two numbers and so on. Right. Questions on this proof? Awesome.